Hello and welcome to lecture 14 of my class from data to decisions. I'm Chris Mack, professor for this course, and this lecture is on how to test for kurtosis. Last time we mentioned that moment testing was the most common way in which we can test whether a distribution is normal or not. Uh, we'll often want to test residuals, for example, uh, from a regression fit to find out if they're normal because for ordinary least squares regression, we make the assumption that they are. We can test for normality in a number of ways. We're going to look at some other ways in the future, but uh, for right now, we're going to concentrate on moment testing. In the last lecture, we looked at skewness testing. Skewness was the third standardized moment of a distribution. And today we're going to look at kurtosis, the fourth standardized moment. As a review, the kth centered moment is given by this first equation where we take x, we subtract off its mean value or its expected value. Uh, this, for example, could be all the residuals where we take our model and data and subtract off the model data. So the residual raised to the kth power multiplied by the probability distribution function, the data, integrate that all values and that becomes our kth centered moment. We then standardize that moment by dividing by our estimate of the standard deviation to the kth power. V sub 3 was called skewness and we looked at a test for skewness last time. Here we're going to look at kurtosis which is the fourth standardized moment. In particular take phi sub 4, the fourth standardized moment, subtract off 3, and we'll call that quantity gamma 2 the excess kurtosis. Uh, why do we subtract off 3? Recall from last lecture that 3 was the value of phi sub 4, the fourth standardized moment, for the case of a normal distribution. So if I subtract off 3, and if gamma 2 is positive, that means we have more kurtosis than we ha than a normal distribution. And if gamma 2 is negative, we have less kurtosis than a, uh, a normal distribution. Now, sometimes we call gamma 2 the kurtosis. Sometimes we call phi 4 the kurtosis. And so uh, many people, I think I have to admit myself included, will use those terms somewhat ambiguously. However, the term excess kurtosis is very standardized. If I say excess kurtosis, you know I mean gamma 2. That is the amount in excess of a normal distribution. So I'll try and be uh, more explicit as I talk to refer to the excess kurtosis as the thing that we're testing. However, I'm sure I'll slip up and call it kurtosis every now and again. Uh, what, how can we interpret the value of the excess kurtosis? Well, if we have a unimodal distribution and it's symmetric, that is, it, it has a gamma 1 of 0, a skewness of 0, then it's very easy to interpret the value, the meaning of, of gamma 2. A positive excess kurtosis means heavy tails. It means the tails are heavier than a normal distribution. And a negative kurtosis means light tails. The, the tails are lighter than a normal distribution. Well, since the area under probability distribution is always one, if the tails are heavy, that means the center is narrower or more peaked. If the tails are light, it means the center is broader. So these two things always go together. Let's look at a couple examples. Maybe the easiest example to see is the student's T distribution. Uh, hopefully you've seen the student's T distribution many times before. And if you compare the student's T distribution to a normal distribution, you find that the tails are heavier. In fact, we can derive a formula for the excess kurtosis, and it is 6 divided by the degrees of freedom minus 4. So uh, the degrees of freedom is one of the parameters of the student's t distribution. As the degrees of parameter, uh, freedom gets larger and larger, gamma 2 goes to 0. In other words, uh, as, we, as you probably know, degrees of freedom gets large, the student's t distribution approaches the normal distribution. Uh, for a uniform distribution, gamma 2 is negative. Well, a uniform distribution is flat, 
come straight down at the two endpoints, the min and the max values. And then, well, there's no tails. Right? The tail is very, very light because there is no tail. And gamma 2 is minus 6 fifths, so close to minus 1. What does excess kurtosis mean? It can mean a lot of things, but probably the most important way in which it impacts our analysis is it makes, it changes the way we think about uncertainty in our variance. So if we have a normal distribution, we estimate the variance of that normal distribution with the variance of the sample. The sample variance will have an expected value of the population variance if we use an, uh, an unbiased estimator, which we normally do, right? But what is the uncertainty in that estimate? Well, if, for a normal distribution, the variance of the variance, the variance of our estimate variance of the population, in other words, the variance of our sample variance, is two times the true standard deviation to the fourth power divided by n minus one. Usually we, again, estimate this by sticking our s, our standard deviation from the sample in this equation to give us our best estimate of the variance of the variance. But that assumes that we had a normal distribution. If we have a distribution with an excess kurtosis gamma 2, that changes our estimate of the variance of the variance. You can see it uh, has the same multiplier out front of gamma 2 in the equation now. How, do, how does that work? Well, let's look at the case where n is kind of large compared to 1. So maybe n's 100, for example. This thing out front here is about one half, right? So the variance of our sample variance will be the same variance we would expect if we had a normal distribution times one plus about one half times the excess kurtosis. If the excess kurtosis is positive, that is we have heavy tails, then our variance estimate has more uncertainty. Right? If gamma two is one, we have about 50% more uncertainty in the, the variance of the variance. If gamma 2, however, is negative, that means we have lighter tails. That mean, means we have less uncertainty in our estimate of the variance. So it can be useful to understand what the excess kurtosis is just to get a better idea of how good our estimates of variance or standard deviation really are. Kurtosis was defined in a couple of slides ago, but generally we don't have the true population and its PDF. So instead we estimate the excess kurtosis with a sample kurtosis. So our sample excess kurtosis, G2, given by this formula, uh, and we've seen these uh, samples of the uh, moments earlier in the last lecture. So given a set of data, we can easily calculate what our sample kurtosis is. For a very large value of n, the sampling distribution of this statistic G2 will be about normal with a mean of zero, zero and a variance of 24 over n. For small samples, this estimator is biased, just like we saw last time with the uh, sample skewness. We can develop an unbiased estimator by multiplying by uh, a factor that that goes to one when, when n is large. So this now is our unbiased estimator of the sample excess kurtosis. We'll call it capital G2. And this will be what we actually use for our testing. The standard error of that estimate is given by the equation below. The standard error of G1 is the standard error of our estimate of the skewness, and that was provided in the last lecture. So we can use this sample estimate of the excess kurtosis to test our distribution for normality. 
and we'd expect this excess kurtosis to be zero. So our null hypothesis is that gamma two equals zero. That is, we really do have a normal distribution. Now we're only going to perform this kurtosis test if the skewness test fails. Uh, so if we find in the skewness test that the distribution is skewed, it's not symmetric, well then there's no need to do a kurtosis test. We know we're, it's not normal, we're done. But if the skewness test fails to reject the null hypothesis that the distribution is symmetric, then we can perform the kurtosis test. Our test statistic is G2 divided by the standard error of G2, and this will be approximately standard normal, as long as we have a reasonable number of data points, say more than 20. Uh, we perform a two-tailed test because we don't have any idea whether it's positive excess kurtosis or negative excess kurtosis. Either one of them destroys our assumption of a normal distribution. So we compare the test statistic, G2 over the standard error of G2, to a critical z-value for the given significance level. Recall that if uh, our significance level is 0.05, it's a z-value of about 1.96. About two sigma away from the mean uh, is a 95% confidence interval. If the test st statistic is larger than 1.96, then we can reject the null hypothesis to a significance level of Uh, one last topic, uh, sometimes people will combine the skewness and kurtosis tests into one. Uh, the skewness statistic is G1 over the standard error of G1. Our kurtosis statistic is G2 over the standard error of G2. Both of these are normally distributed under the null hypothesis. Therefore, if I, if I square them and sum them together, uh, I would expect to get a distribution that is chi-squared with two degrees of freedom. Uh, this is pretty much just the definition of chi-square. So we could test this one single statistic against a critical value of chi-squared. For example, with a significance level of 0.05, the critical value for chi-squared with two degrees of freedom is about 6. And with the alpha 0.01, the value is 9.2. We could use those and, and do one test all at once. I generally don't do that. I generally test skewness. If it passes that, then I test kurtosis. One uh, other thing to be aware of is that both the skewness test and the kurtosis test are very sensitive outlier detectors. In fact, any test for normality is almost by default a test for outliers as well. Why? One outlier is, if it's big enough, is generally enough to make the distribution look non-normal. An outlier can make the distribution appear skewed. If I have a couple of outliers, one on either side of the mean, then it will appear that we have these heavy tails. So often, not always, but often we'll fail a skewness test or a kurtosis test because of the presence of outliers. Therefore, once you've failed, one of these tests, you need to go and look at why you might have failed test. And we're going to talk about outlier detection, what to do about outliers in subsequent lectures. So what have we learned in lecture 14? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, you need to review the materials. How is kurtosis defined? I'll remind you again, I'm not expecting anyone to memorize equations here. Need to be able to find the equation when you need it. For positive excess kurtosis, what is the shape of the PDF, the probability distribution function? And similarly, what does that shape look like for negative excess kurtosis? And finally, you should be able to test a sample data set for excess kurtosis. What is the test statistic that we use and what is its sampling distribution? How do you perform that test? You should be able to do that. That's it for lecture 14. Till next time.